We all know that oil drives the modern world as a fuel, as a tradable commodity, as a source of geopolitical conflict, and as a target of environmental protests, oil flows through our lives in innumerable ways. And yet, it is less often that we think about how oil influences our culture, whether via the ubiquitous car culture of North America or the unique culture of oil patch towns. The idea of a petroculture pops up in the movies we watch, the books we read, and the many movements and exchanges in our daily lives. Just as oil is everywhere, so too is the culture of oil. Welcome to the first episode of Cross Currents, a podcast of Memorial University's Nexus Center, a research center devoted to interdisciplinary inquiry housed in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. My name is John Sandlos, and I'm the director of the Nexus Center. For this first episode, myself and research assistant Alana Feld sat down to talk with English professors Deneen Farquharson and Fiona Pollock. And we talked about their work studying petrocultures, and particularly their project Cold Water Oil, about the culture of oil in the North Atlantic. Now, you've been working with a larger network that's trying to uncover the cultural dimensions of oil. Can you tell us a little bit about that network? Yeah, I guess around the same time that we started independently getting interested in questions of oil, we became aware of a, a group at the University of Alberta called the Petrocultures Research Group. Um, they set up in 2011, and the whole purpose of that group is to kind of bring together people that are interested in oil and energy and, and how they, as the name suggests, <laughs> um, affect culture. So we got in touch with them. Well, we actually asked Imra Zeman, who's one of the co-founders of it, to come to Memorial in 2013. He gave a public lecture here. Um, and that was sort of the, the beginning of our involvement, real involvement with that group. And we've subsequently gone on to, to host one of their conferences last year. We had the Petrocultures Conference here, which was fantastic. Wow. Now, most people, when they think of oil, they think of it as something that goes in a barrel, something that you pump into your car. Uh, here in Newfoundland, we think about it going into our, our furnaces. We don't usually, we, we sometimes think of it as an economic indicator. What's the price of oil? We want it to be high here in Newfoundland. In Ontario, they want it to be low. Um, but we don't often think of it as a cultural artifact or something that's an expression of culture. And how, how, does, that, how does that work? How is oil part of culture? I guess it's um, the way to think of it is not so much that it's a cultural artifact, but it is the, in so many of those of us working in the area, we think of it as the conditioning element of our culture. Mm -hmm. So that's why there's the title or the label petrocultures, that we live in a petroleum or a hydrocarbon culture. And so it infuses and infiltrates every element of um, how our cities are organized, how our lives are structured, how we engage with our neighbors and our communities, but in very particular ways for Fiona and I and other people like us in other places, um, we're interested in questions about how does that petroculture become represented or reflected in things like visual arts, film, documentary, literature, and all sorts of other types of, of culture, cultural expressions. So it's in the cultural artifact, but it's also the um, belief, and I think it's hard to, It'd be interesting to, to hear if people would argue against it that our entire culture, how bro however broadly you define it, is one that's driven by and conditioned by hydrocarbon energy sources. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's interesting to think about how that plays out over time because um, in different time periods, other types of materials or energy have been ascendant. I mean, we think about uranium and the, the atomic age, and there was uh, definitely a certain amount of cultural caches, people tried to deal with the, the reality of, of nuclear energy. Um, and I've been doing myself a lot of writing about indigenous copper mining and how mm -hmm. copper became a major um, influence on, on ancient indigenous cultures dating back eight, 9,000 years even, and it was a prestige good and so on. So I, I guess we could say that these types of materials, these types of energy, they there's always one or two that are dominant and they shape the way we think about the, uh, the world that we live in. Yeah. Um, Timothy Mitchell has really interesting ideas about this. I don't know his book, Carbon Democracy, from, mm -hmm. from a few years ago. And he particularly has interesting things to say about coal in, in comparison with oil. And he's, he's interested in sort of the political side of things and how in coal societies, 
people are congregated in communities, you know, the, the mine, the pit is there, they're all working in the one place. And they actually, the collective politics is more what evolves in coal mm -hmm. societies than in oil societies where the oil production is often taking place away from communities, offshore and, you know, distant places. Um, peripatetic workforces, people that come and go, things going out by pipeline. So it, a different politics goes along with oil. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's so many different ways in which energy is just so central to, to the kind of culture that uh, develops. And just to follow up on that comment, I mean, Timothy Mitchell's book, Carbon Democracy, is fundamental in terms mm -hmm. of how I started rethinking my own relationship to oil. And it's, you know, so he has two main arguments in the book. And the first one is that when we think of modernity, in terms of progress post-Age of Enlightenment or, you know, concurrent with the Age of Enlightenment, that that had a certain energy driver, and that was coal. And so he does this fantastic work in 19th century history of coal. But then he, the second argument is basically that if we take the Keynesian economic model uh, to have some validity in terms of how we think of ourselves as modern, um, in the sense that the economy, in quotation marks, is becomes a thing, it becomes a material, it becomes an object that we talk about, uh, that once you move into the post-Second World War, which is when oil supersedes coal as our primary, in terms of what he refers to as the global north, our primary source of energy, we move into a very different form of democracy. So, and, and social politics. And so for him, carbon energy sources, whether it's coal or oil, not only define the limits of modernity, but also define what it means to be modern, whether it's 19th, 20th, or 21st century. So that's, um, so it is slightly different than say gold, copper. Yeah. Although it is interesting, I think there's some work being done in particular by our colleague Andrew Lohman on rubber. Uh, as another type of material object that is um, used as a good, but also as a certain element of tr bound up in economic drivers, like transport, trade, things like that. Yeah, I think the material shapes the culture as much as the culture is designating that material as, as a resource and dictating the way it's being used. And again, go back to the Iranian example, a whole culture of kind of danger has, mm -hmm. has arisen around that. Um, right. But then that leads into thinking about oil and, and how does it manifest itself? What What's unique culturally about oil and how, how does it express itself within contemporary culture? Um, I think you can start from the body out in a mm -hmm. way. Like there's no limit to, to where oil can seep in in terms of, of the cultural um, effects of oil. It's there in the things we rub into our skin in the morning. It's there in the products we eat in terms of, you know, fertilizers used by farmers to, to grow things, to transport of, um, transport of goods is facilitated by oil. It just seeps in absolutely everywhere. I mean, to use a oily kind of metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's kind of hard to know. I mean, there's a, a, a writer, Christopher Jones, who's talked about the dangers of what he calls petromyopia. And, I mean, and what we're doing is part, we're part of this sort of broader movement, I guess, of energy humanity study. You know, thinking about oil, thinking about uranium, thinking about, you know, people are thinking about different things within that. And he kind of says, well, you know, there's a danger in thinking only about petroleum, like you need to be thinking about other things um, as well. But I guess getting back to, you know, the, the point that Deneen made a, a moment ago, oil does seem to be central to our culture in a, in a, at this moment in time, particularly in a North American culture in a way that is, is really important. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the, you mentioned risk and danger, I think one of the um, striking representations of oil that might immediately come to people's minds have to do with disasters. Mm -hmm. um, Deepwater Horizon, offshore ranger, or um, ocean ranger, pipeline leaks, pipeline protests. I mean, the pipeline itself in the last two or three years has become a particularly interesting element of a petrol culture that has been a focal or flashpoint uh, for all sorts of different cultural debates and political debates. Uh, but the disaster is, mm -hmm. is in one element of representations of our oil lives. Uh, that has striking, I think, implications and, and moments. And particularly in terms of Newfoundland and Labrador. I mean, when we started getting interested in what's going on here around cultural representations of oil, we were kind of surprised at how little we were finding. There's, there's actually not that much. Um, but what there is, is, is about disaster, primarily. Yeah. And especially the Ocean Range is a total flashpoint for, 
I mean, over a lot of time, you think about something like Lisa Moore's book, February, which is 2009, and um, I'm actually working at the moment with an archive of photographs that guys that worked on the Ocean Ranger took. They've just these archives have just been donated to the rooms, and they're just extraordinary images. Like people that work and worked in the industry, one of whom died when the when the rig went down, and this sort of viewpoint on this this new world to them because it's you know it's the beginning really of, of offshore oil exploration in in Newfoundland. Um, and there's there's a sense in those pictures of um, I mean, the thing about the story ends so badly, of course, but a sense of kind of excitement about all this cool technology and all these sort of, you know, interesting things that come through in those images that the, the men were taking that worked on that rig. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you think in cultural representations, does it sort of sway one way or the other? Or, or do, does culture represent oil as uh, through a kind of critique of the industry? Or are there much more positive ways of representing oil that, that come through the cultural milieu? Depends where you look. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, think I one of the, the best examples, I have two examples, I think, that you know sort of make the question interesting but also problematize it, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, um, I did a little bit of work on uh, images of offshore oil rigs and you just do a simple Google image search and it was remarkable how certain images replicate just by virtue of them being open license, right, that mm. everybody can use them. And so there are certain um, images of an offshore rig, particularly in the North Atlantic, that you see used by the Guardian newspaper, you see it used by industry, and you see it used also by organizations like Greenpeace. And so there's a banality to some of those replications. They just repeat over and over and over again. Um, so it's all, it's, there's, there's no critique there. It becomes ubiquitous, certain types of images. But at the same time, what's really interesting too is that, I mean, Fiona mentioned, we can talk about the body and, and elements of oil. We're talking about the byproducts of oil production, right? And plastic in particular. And how pervasive that is, right? Mm -hmm. So from every, from the packaging in the grocery store, it's not just those plastic bags that some people take their groceries home in. Mm -hmm. It's every bottle. It's every plastic wrapper inside. It's the glue that fixes the cardboard boxes together. Uh, every antihistamine, vitamin, uh, you know, all those medications that are gel caps all exist because of hydrocarbon byproducts. And this is particularly potent for academics and students, soft contact lenses and eyeglasses, right? We would, none of those things would exist as they currently do without oil production. But what's interesting is that this is sometimes referred to as the inventory of oil or the inventory of plastics. So it's that inventory of how so many things in our lives, it's like every clothing, every shoe for the most part, uh, computers, Cell phones, none of these can work as they currently are constructed without plastic bits. Um, so that inventory of how it's everywhere uh, is used, it started actually, it was initiated by the oil industry in the 40s and the 50s to continually convince consumers that you need us, right? Your lives depend on this. And that inventory has then also been put to use to critique how much control or, well, I don't know if there is a better word, how much control that oil production, manufacturing, distribution industry has over the way we think of normal life or everyday life. So uh, there's certain elements of cu cultural representations of oils that can be put to use mm -hmm. in, in a lot of different directions. Yeah. I guess coming that from a literary perspective, given that that's you know, where we started out, um, when you look at writing about oil production, so you look at things like Upton Sinclair's Oil from way back in 1927 or um, Cities of Salt by a Saudi Arabian writer, Abdul Rahman Munif, work about oil production is just about always negative. It always concentrate, it concentrates on disaster, concentrates on the ripping up of communities, concentrates on exploitation. It's, it's, it's actually, I've yet to read a novel, <laughs> that, 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 you know, a, a literary novel, I guess, um, that is positive in a sense about industry so so yeah it depends genre matters a lot in thinking about oil it, I mean, people do different things in different genres i think just if i could follow up again so we're not going to shut up now no we? no we're you're going to have trouble <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of this is speaking very broadly um how do you approach uh, a cultural text or particularly a literary text for fiona and i in terms of the relationship to energy production. 
there's you, you go at you go looking for texts that are explicitly about energy or about oil but you can also take an approach to anything that has been published in what we think of as a petroculture and and look at how that energy life informs what's actually going on in terms of character or plot or even imagery and metaphor and so that's more of what we you can sometimes terms a symptomatic reading of a text and I'm doing a little bit of work on Anne Enright's novel, The Gathering, which is an Irish novel. No one would pick that up and say, this is about oil. It's not about oil. And yet every single key moment of the main character's relationship to her traumatic past and her working through of that memory is articulated by her being in a car or at a petrol station. And there's a great moment where she recognizes this fact of her existence she doesn't go very far with it, but that's another way of tracking uh, the petroculture in a text that is about so many other things uh, besides explicitly dealing with the industry or people involved with um, that kind of oil life. Yeah, and I guess you can get things too that are, sorry, now I'm not going to stop at all, <laughs> that are in between those two exactly. things. Exactly. Think about the genre of the road novel. Right. Think of, I mean, that is a genre that couldn't exist <laughs> without oil. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, okay, and dystopian talking. fictions, you know, yeah. the, those futuristic ones. Mm -hmm. What happens after this oil life implodes, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, that's a whole genre in itself. Yeah. I'm reading American War right now by uh, Omar al Akkad, and it's, it's about, it's a dystopian novel about an American Civil War actually fought over the use of fossil fuels with the North <laughs> trying to ban fossil fuels and the South uh, clandestinely using them. And resisting in populist terms the, the the ban and it's it's a brutal florida has disappeared people right. have moved in from the coast um and it's imagining this war happening starting in 2074 which is not that far from now and so it's a terrifying yeah. mm -hmm. and yet completely engaging novel um that i think definitely falls under the rubric of petroculture mm -hmm. yeah and the signature one that most people start with is cormac mccarthy's the road right yeah. Yes, and I just yes. slash your wrist after you've read that book. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was just thinking even of Jack Kerouac's On the Road. Yes. On the Road. Yeah, yeah completely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you both have a piece in the remarkable collection of short essays, Fueling Culture, by Ermi Seisman, Jennifer Linzel, and Patricia Yeager. What are the origins of this volume, and how did so many perspectives on oil, 101 of them in total, come to be collected in a single book? I don't know if we're either of us are entirely sure about how that uh, collection came to be, but uh, we were invited to contribute when Imre Zeman was here at Memorial giving a public lecture. And I suspect that the genesis of that goes back much further to a very important uh, PMLA special issue that Patricia Yeager, um, now just recently and tragically deceased, uh, organized around energy sources. And it wasn't just about oil. She was very much interested in, in rubber and gold and copper and some of these other things. So um, I'm guessing, but I think Patricia Yeager might have been one of the real foundational movers and shakers of that. So the three of them um, decided that they would do this fueling culture. And I suspect that they approached people that they knew were, who were interested in it, and they, they offered us to write on whatever key word we thought would, would be appropriate. And so Fiona and I wanted to write on the offshore rig, because uh, that's what we were most interested in at the time and still are. But I think that there are, I do know that the book grew and grew and grew and grew, which um, Jennifer Wenzel at one point said was a true testament to just how deep and robust our relationship to fuel is as a culture, is that there were more and more of these um, elements that people wanted to speak to. But what's also interesting about that is that uh, they kept us rigidly to a very short or narrow word uh, count. It's a, they're short pieces. Mm -hmm. And I think the all along the importance that they were hoping for is that they wanted it to be sort of like they called it a thought piece. Uh, a contemplation of this word or this idea and um, it's come out finally and it's it's spectacular it's it'd be interesting to see how it will be used or read or consulted because uh, it's an unusual kind of academic book in that regard mm. yeah. I think it's part two of this there's this flurry of publications now in energy humanities I mean it's such a new field and it's really only in the last even 
five years yeah. that, that it's got going. And so Fueling Culture, and um, there's now there's an Energy Humanities Reader that's just been published. There's another one I think that's being done in the UK. Um, there's a book, Petrocultures, out of the first Petrocultures conference that's just come out literally in the last month or so. So there's just now starting to be a groundswell of publications coming out in Energy Humanities. And I think the book was very much intended to try and draw attention to this work and try and you know get people interested in it. Yeah. And I think it's a real sign that the field, if, you, if we can call it that, of Energy Humanities or Petrocultures, has reached a certain point that there has been something already published about how myopic it already yeah. is, right? We've already, it's already being critiqued as being too narrow or anything like that. So it's it's an area of study or just a way of framing what we've always done in a different way uh, that's reaching a, a really interesting moment where there's starting to be some pushback and internal critique, which is excellent. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The the pieces are almost poetic too. And some of them are, yeah. they're beautifully written, yeah. some of them, yeah. It's very interesting. Uh, so both of you are also working on uh, a project, Cold Water Oil. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that? Well, I guess it got started back in 2011, so that's sort of in the height of the oil boom in Newfoundland, and, and I started wondering about where where are the cultural representations of this oil boom, like we've, it's just affecting our lives in such a profound kind of way and I started talking to Janine about this and we you know agreed we wanted to, to work on it together um, and applied for a small grant to get us going and you know had some put together a big database of, of anything and everything we could find that is about oil in terms of you know poems not films whatever sort of cultural stuff floating around um, in Newfoundland and Labrador and um, the offshore rig piece was sort of the first thing we really wrote together um, and you know talk later I guess about what comes next we're still trying to figure that out but it's almost as if and it sort of goes back to what we just were talking about those books it's just sort of hit a nerve of something because suddenly it we were involved in all these things that we didn't even know existed it just it just seemed to be topical in a way that we weren't even really aware of um, when we began I think the the aha moment uh, for me was when when a conversation Fiona and I were having and this was embedded in her and I wanting to sort of generally collaborate on something re related to the North Atlantic, uh, Newfoundland and, and Labrador, but also other North Atlantic spaces. And, uh, you know, Fiona posed the question, what isn't anybody talking about? Right? What, what is not really part of the conversation? And when she said it's oil, we were like, I was like, yes, exactly. So then we started, you know, w randomly without any kind of coherent plan searching for what might be out there and that's how we found the petrocultures research cluster in alberta at the university of alberta and then that led us also to rice university center for energy and environmental humanities we realized that other people were posing similar questions some were a little more advanced on the organizational front than we were but we were able to join that conversation so that's how it got going but the big thing for us most recently was the fueling culture coming out, although we worked on that, it took a while. Edited collections take a while to come out, uh, was when we hosted the Petrocultures 2016 conference last, the end of last summer. And that gave us a chance to bring to St. John's and to Memorial um, a lot of these people who are thinking and working through these issues in different places, different geographic locations which have their own attendant local and national inflections of these. And so now we're at a point where we're thinking, you know, research collaborations, and it was very valuable that way. And, you know, we've got a website up and thinking about next, next steps in terms of our own publication, both together, but Fiona and I also have different interests that take us on our own as well. So it's a constantly moving um, and organic in a way. Uh, project. So we're happy to you know, hear what other people think if they have suggestions. Uh, so what is different about the way offshore oil has been represented culturally when compared to the terrestrial industry? I think the most obvious comparison that comes to my mind is, and that would be recognizable to many people anyway, is the photography and film work of Edward Bertinsky who's, you know, I mean, his exhibit, Oil, came to the rooms, was that 2013? Mm -hmm. I got the date wrong, I'm sure. Yeah. Anyway, so his, you know, enormous photographs of the infrastructure of oil production and manufacture and transportation and 
uh, disposal in a way. So Bratinsky's, at that point when he came out with oil, the, the photographic exhibit uh, was very much terrestrial, even though he has since moved on. Right? He has some of the most, I think, recognizable images of the aftermath of the deep water horizon uh, spill and blowout, which is the oil slick on the ocean. So uh, those, I think, terrestrially, when we do have visual images of oil, they are these huge, it's the size, it's the enormity. Uh, it's trafficking almost in the sublime, that it's awesome and beautiful and terrible at the same time. With the offshore, uh, and you know, I hesitate to be too definitive about it because the offshore in the North Atlantic is a is a different kind of set of images and considerations than it is, say, off the coast of Nigeria or in the Gulf of Mexico, or things like that. But the offshore in the North Atlantic, from what I've been looking at, is bound up with ice and cold, and so those elements of danger and risk, the extreme. Uh, tropes of the frontier also are bound up there. Um, so the offshore is a particular kind of, certainly the way it's framed by industry and politicians all the time, and I'm speaking North America in particular, uh, as like the next frontier, you know, like, you know, settling people on the moon is one thing, but drilling in the Arctic is another. Uh, the other thing about until this past summer, until this past six months, offshore oil, maybe it's just because I've been interested in that, uh, was a, has been a very, very long-standing site of protest and activism in terms of Greenpeace's activities and, and stop drilling in the Arctic, save the Arctic. And so there's a whole set of um, ideas and perceptions and political agenda around the offshore drilling in the Arctic uh, that doesn't necessarily happen terrestrially, but I think that's now much more complicated with um, you know, the pipelines in the US and pipeline protests everywhere. So again, it's, it's moving. I think now, if, if there's one thing I can say about representations of oil, uh, in, and I think very specifically in the last six months, it's about wh where are the protests, where are the pushback against industry development, industry um, using spaces and lands, and even crazy, I mean crazy, it's crazy to think of drilling in the Arctic, uh, but that's re retreated, I think, in the popular consciousness from some of those pipeline protests. Yeah, I think just in a sort of implicit in, in what Deneen's already been saying in a sense, but the offshore is out of sight in a way that land-based oil is not. I mean, sure, you know, the captain's between barbed, you know, behind barbed wire fences or whatever, but mm -hmm. we, if we're not directly working in the industry, we have to kind of imagine the offshore, and it, t it takes more work to imagine the offshore, I think. Um, and in fact, I mentioned that uh, Lisa Moore novel February a while ago, but that that novel ends with this character trying to imagine herself onto the Ocean Ranger, her husband's working on the Ocean Ranger, when the rig goes down, this huge imaginative exercise, like what is it actually like to work out there in the middle of the ocean, to be on this weird structure that part ship, part factory, part quotidian kind of you know place where you can play ping pong. You know, It's kind of this weirdness of, of that space. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this idea of things being out of sight, I think is really different. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in your essay, In Fueling Culture, you mentioned the representations of oil rigs in Lars von Trier's Breaking the Waves. His is a very dark vision of life on an oil rig. Is it oil itself that is important here, or is it von Trier's simply using an oil rig as a symbolic representation of danger and darkness? Or is it the thing itself, oil exploitation, that is important too? I don't think Lars von Trier cares about oil uh, as an industry. Mm -hmm. When he was making Breaking the Waves, in as much as you can trust anything Lars von Trier says about his own <laughs> films, yeah. uh, I mean, he's one of those annoying creators who will deliberately say, make something up and say, this is what I intended. But mm -hmm. um, he, he, Breaking the Waves is a film, in my reading, about outliers before that term became popular with Malcolm Gladwell's use of it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's set on this island off the coast of Scotland in the North Atlantic, and then there's the oil rig. And so the oil rig in the film, it's complicated. It's not, uh, I think, a straightforward symbolic representation of anything other than outside. It's on the edge, 
right? And the edges of, and those boundaries between all sorts of things are what's really driving von Trier's vision there. But the rig too, I don't think it's actually a, a symbolic representation of danger, uh, even though um, people are injured and killed on the rig. It's, it's exotic. It's so outside. I mean, Bess's character is attracted in no small way uh, to the men, all, and including her husband on the rig, um, because they're so different. They're so different. They come from another country. These are people, men from Norway, who were flown in to work on the rig. They listen to different music. They have accents. They look different. And of course, her own community is very, very um, repressive and, you know, uh, restricted, restrictive in so many things. But the rig at the very end of the film, right, is the, the only place that recognizes Bess's ascension, because it's a martyr's tale, that whole film. And so she ascends to her status as almost saint, as problematic as that is in terms of von Trier's uh, use of the female character. The only people who recognize it are the men on the rig. They hear the bells toll. And so the rig becomes this very interesting space off offshore right and Fiona might be able to speak to you because this is really her interest the rig is like an island off the coast of an island off the coast of an island and it is a whole community that's absolutely foreign to Bess and her family and her friends uh, so it's exotic but it's also unique it's so different uh, so while the, the, the vision of the film is absolutely dark I think at the end, it's, um, I think Von Trier shoots the rig as if it's like a cathedral. The bells ring over top of the rig. Uh, what is a cathedral of? I don't know. I'm not going to speculate on that one. Uh, but he wanted something that's out, 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 out on the edges. And the oil rig, offshore rig was perfect for him. Obviously, oil platforms are a place of danger, but there's a certain amount of utopianism that you've seen in some of the literature around oil platforms, uh, you know, places that are kind of act as a site of healing where they become coral reefs and so on. It, 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 can you tell us how, about the positive future that's sometimes ascribed to these places? Some really interesting ideas about what happens to abandoned oil rigs. <laughs> so the, the rigs to reef. Riggs Reefs um, project in the in the U.S. is a particularly great example of that. And there's a Swedish um, environmental historian called Dolly Jorgensen who's written some mm -hmm. really really interesting stuff about that uh, program. So, in one sense, you could say that it lets the oil companies off the hook in a mm -hmm. sense because they can, when they're finished with the rig, they're allowed to sink it and it becomes a reef and it becomes this you know place where fish congregate and it's a positive environmental thing but it, it, it means the companies don't have to pay to remove remove the structure so they like that and then they can sound like they're environmentally friendly as well so there's that kind of complexity around it um but yes on the other hand it's it is a positive thing <laughs> in terms of fish habitat and and all the rest of it um i think you know it, it, it's a great example of the sort of ways that we're now starting to think about nature human culture you know nature human intersection sort of donna haraway's ways of thinking about things and it's things ideas about you can't actually separate this stuff out we're beyond the point where there's some pristine nature that exists separate it's you know from the age of the anthropocene all the rest of it so there's not an easy way of thinking about about that that conjunction but yeah so that's one kind of i guess utopianism the idea of of the sunken rig providing a kind of environmental um, habitat um, and different uses for rigs too. So as as ideal communities have been sort of like notions about converting oil rigs into utopian style communities. And that does go back to the islands thing that Deneen mentioned in passing a, a second ago that there are a lot of parallels, I think, between the way we think about rigs and this long standing cultural history about the way we think about islands. There's some really interesting overlaps there. And of course, you know that that idea that you, know, you go to the island and you start your new community, break off from the from the mainland where things have gone wrong, go to this utopian setting, and you know Thomas More's utopia back to 1500s, and and recreate things. And and some of that is sort of reached over into into ideas about rigs. I think. Yeah, it's it's so fascinating because in my own work on mining, I see exactly the same thing that you have these. Um, the industry likes to promote images of these projects where an open pit has been filled and made into a lake and everybody's sailing on the lake and everybody's happy and, and, mm -hmm. and, and the, in fact the implication is almost that a better space has been made out mm -hmm. of the abandoned mine 
And then people on the more environmentalist side of the ledger, they want to promote the idea that these are ruined landscapes, that they've been irrevocably altered, there's no healing, that there are toxic liabilities that will last for generations. In reality, um, these places can be both of these things exactly. because certain kinds of mines produce certain kinds of outcomes. Other kinds of mines that are perhaps more benign, you can repair and restore them. Mm -hmm. So it's not one or the other. Um, but I think people marshal these images to fit a certain mm -hmm. politics yeah. that, that they want to get across. I just was thinking too about the example of the, you know, the Chernobyl landscape. So that now that's that amazing sort of <laughs> inadvertent wildlife refuge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. At the same time, it's completely toxic. Yeah, well, and the Rocky Martin Mountain Arsenal has been the one that's been cited right. a lot as America's yeah. most toxic wildlife reserve yeah. or whatever, but there's all kinds of wildlife there because people don't yeah. go there very Just much. Just left it alone. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, really interesting. I wanted to go back uh, a little bit to um, thinking about culture in places that we don't normally see culture. So on your website, there's a picture of both of you standing beside a gas pump and you talk about on the website you know, seeing culture and you know, moving outside of literary texts, which are obviously culture, and thinking about a gas pump as a cultural artifact. So how do, how do all these sites of oil production and distribution become car cultural artifacts? We've talked about the oil rig, but what about a gas pump? I think we've sort of become blind to gas pumps <laughs> in yeah. a way. Like all of these elements of petroculture, we don't see them. They absolutely turn for granted. And you think how, in historical terms, how new they are, really. I mean, mm. it just really a hundred years, even if that, for a lot of these things, and you know, the infrastructure of freeways, all the rest of it, we totally take them for granted. And and I think really one of the, the, the key elements of stuff that people are working in petroculture is doing like, okay, let's just pay attention to these things. The gas mm -hmm. pump has a history, you know? Yeah. There's a, there's, we take this thing for granted, but there's a whole culture embedded in this um, artifact here. When we uh, had that picture taken, we were also contemplating in terms of local uh, artifacts of oil. Uh, if you drive around Stavanger and the area, the street signs. Stavanger is, of course, named after another offshore oil site in Norway. There's Aberdeen Street. That street's named because Aberdeen in Scotland is a major site and location f to facilitate offshore um, drilling. And so just this, that our street signs and our streets are labeled because of this industry and because of our relationship, our local relationship to oil and gas, but also the just the global relationship to it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, hidden in plain sight is a phrase that's often uh, used to describe this peculiar relationship that everybody, certainly in Canada and particularly in Newfoundland and Labrador, have to oil at the moment. Yeah, I can think of two other aspects of this. There are adults of a certain age, around our age, <laughs> often think nostalgically about, you know, they used to come in and put the gas in for you. Right? Right. Yeah. It wasn't all self-serve. Self there used to be a bit more of a, of a personal yeah. connection here. And uh, actually, there's an Ontario uh, kind of indie singer, uh, Fred Eaglesmith, who's written a song about the White Rose filling station, and it's just a memory now, and they built the high, you know, it's sort of like a local gathering place where people hung out. I even see this with my, my own children. They go up to the gas station with their friends and right. hang out and, and mm -hmm. stuff like that, because there's like treats, and I guess that doesn't have anything to do directly with oil, but because of the way these places are distributed neighborhood by neighborhood, you know, almost everybody has the experience of going to the gas station for one thing or another, whether it's your fuel mm -hmm. or you need a, a, a carton of milk, milk or whatever. Yeah. yeah, the gas station is sort of like the lifeline. Like on Christmas Day, if you need something, the gas station is always <laughs> right. there. Right? <laughs> and so it's the gas pump or the gas station is is the way is the act is one access point to thinking more about the automobile culture. Right. right? Uh, and and it's it's a moving and shifting culture, of course, because I've seen a, f a beautiful exhibit of photography of abandoned drive-in theaters that are now grassed over and weeded, um, drive-in theaters and uh, drive-in restaurants. A and W's in Canada used to drive in and they put the ledge on your window. That's a kind a form of nostalgia, and people have talked about petro nostalgia uh, or hydrocarbon nostalgia, and so it's 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 uncovering or remarking upon these moments is just a first step in starting to understand how our very lives are organized mm -hmm. and structured and made normal or made convenient. The fact that those stores are called convenience stores is because mm -hmm. you can drive into them, yeah. right? And they're always open and um, by oil. 
by yeah. hydrocarbon extractions, right? Yeah. There's a lot of oil-related research, research at Memorial University. Um, most of it is focused on developing technology to enhance the expansion and productivity of the industry. And a lot of it is also funded by the oil and gas industry. Uh, do you see your work as part of a larger oil research community at the university, or is it something that stands apart from this industry? The, the easy and immediate answer is that uh, yes, of course, our work is connected mm -hmm. to other oil research. Yeah. We're aware of and constantly looking for and being interested in other types of research related to the oil and gas industry. Um, and, I mean, I think some of the most significant things that are going on at Memorial University, particularly in the engineering faculty, have to do with safety, enhancing safety, and that's vital. Mm -hmm. That's so important because even though... Um, we can talk about transitioning away from an oil culture, alternative sources of energy. In the, that's not going to happen anytime soon, and it's not going to happen quickly, unless there's the kind of apocalyptic disaster that, that we, we talk about. So yes, of course we're part of that. But at the same time, uh, it's important that the kinds of work that Fiona and I do and encourage and become part of and contribute to is also apart from it because we do feel very strongly that we're offering a kind of critical lens to those discussions about oil. Mm -hmm. uh, public conversations about oil and gas are do tend to go towards the economy, uh, and it, those are important discussions, the local and the, and the provincial and the national and the global economy. It has to do with technological advances, it's science, technology, and uh, if if we can add another element of thinking about our relationship to oil through a kind of humanities lens or a cultural lens, then I think it just, it just needs to be part of those conversations. So yes, um, we're part of it, but we also do believe, or I certainly I believe, I'm speaking for Fiona at the moment, uh, I believe that the conversation has been very one-sided to this point, and certainly um, the, the funding availability and the support for oil-related research has been imbalanced in terms of its, what gets types of funding or what gets types of attention as well. Some of that attention is absolutely necessary because so many individual people's lives and livelihoods depend on that research. Uh, but we hope to open up and broaden that conversation and those debates and those discussions to think more deeply and more robustly about oil and our relationships to it. I think too that, I mean, the elephant in the room here is climate change. <laughs> you know, we, we have to be thinking about after oil. We can't just be thinking about oil. And um, I mean, we've been involved in a project. I'm not quite sure what its status is now. There's sort of funding questions around it, but a project called After Oil really Focus, this is again through the University of Alberta, through Petrocultures, focused on trying to imagine different ways of being. So we have this idea of, you know, we've been talking about this oil culture, this world we live in is saturated with this oil culture, mm -hmm. but in a way that can prevent us from imagining other kinds of cultures, and it's really important to be imagining those because we have to get off of oil. <laughs> we have to do that. And, um, you know, I think we have a bit of a job to do there in, you know, critiquing that dependence. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not going to be an easy task to think about. It's not as simple as replacing oil energy with wind or solar or tidal energy. That has to be part of the picture. But if we actually become more aware of how pervasive our lives with oil is in terms of the street signs and the cars and the drive throughs and the plastics, we have to start thinking of how are we going to organize our social structures and our daily lives differently. And it doesn't mean that we're coming up with answers, but we want to move the conversation and move the intellectual energy of which there is so much at Memorial and other places in those different directions. So, Fiona, you've had some experience in uh, talking about petrocultures with some of your grad students recently. I'm curious what the reception has been. Really enthusiastic, yeah. I think, the reception has been. I mean, Danny and I both taught um, sort of one-off classes in the Master of Humanities um, program as well, but in the in the winter I taught a full grad class on called Petro Fictions. And um, it was just 
I think we both experienced this kind of aha moment when we first started, you know, thinking about oil. And then when you start thinking about it, you can't stop thinking about it. And I think that happened in that class as well, that people were like, oh, my God, yes, this is just, I need to be thinking about this stuff. I need to be sort of thinking critically about these things. Um, it was a really great class. And at the end of it, um, I'd asked the students to do a collaborative project that I wasn't really involved in at all. I just wanted them to come up with something on their own because so much of this energy humanities work is collaborative. We're dealing with these really big problems so you have to be working in teams of people. Mm -hmm. And they came up with this great Petrofictionary, which is sort of, it's, it's online, it needs a bit of work still, but it's, it's, uh, it's all these sort of key words that had come up in the course. Um, and, you know, again, try to cut a lexicon around uh, oil and culture. So it was a really positive experience, I think. Great. So both of you seem to be just getting started with your, your work on cold water oil. Can you tell us a bit about what's in the future, what we have to look forward to? I guess we're still figuring that out. Yeah. We're we still were kind of exhausted at the end of Petra Cultures. We needed to take a little break and do sort of our own things for a little while. It's so, true. Uh, yeah, I we're, think we're figuring it out. As Fiona said, <laughs> the work in energy humanities, I can't even think of an exception to this, is, is collaborative. So uh, one of the first things we, we're focusing on is making more concrete some um, research relationships with, in particular, colleagues in Scotland that we've connected with, uh, and then maybe some in, in other parts of the UK. And Fiona has her own research interests that she, she will pursue, and I have my own as well. I'm working on a piece about Greenpeace's Save, Save the Arctic campaign uh, and looking at the imagery around that. Uh, and then I think at some point, I don't know, we'll maybe co-write again. That was an interesting experience. It came off beautifully in the end, but it's uh, it's labor intensive, right, John? I mean, you know, writing together. Uh, so we're we're kind of just assessing at this stage, uh, but it's going to keep going, and it'll probably have more than one direction, right? Yeah, I mean, we are tossing around the idea of a, of a volume sort of coming out of the conference, but drawing in other things as well. That's that's probably maybe <laughs> going to happen. I don't know. We're figuring it out, but yes, it will keep going in one form or another for sure. All right. Well, it all sounds fascinating and uh, this was a great uh, chat about your work and, and Elena and I want to thank you for coming into the Nexus Center today and, and uh, this has been fantastic. Thank well thank you, you both for inviting us. Yes, it's been good. For, for more information on the cold water oil and the petrocultures projects you can find links on our show notes page. Just go to www.hss.mun.ca forward slash nexus forward slash podcasts. To find out about future episodes of Cross Currents, you can follow us on Twitter at Nexus Center, search up our Facebook page, or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. The music used in this podcast was licensed under a Creative Commons license, and you can find out more about the music through the links on our show notes. The Nexus Center is generously supported by the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at Memorial and the Vice President's Research Office at the University. For episode two, we will be talking with Professor Max Lebron and members of the Civic Laboratory for Environmental Action Research about their work monitoring marine plastics in the ocean. We hope you can join us.